Beneath the Highway. Vivify Studio Stories. One, two, three, four. It was a foolish act that showed the brothers' lack of experience with large amounts of water. Shows arrogance even when such young boys can be accused of arrogance. But perhaps it would be more accurate to call it innocent. It was a long winter followed by a rainy march and I guess the adventure felt delayed. They were probably exploring the fields on the edge of town, now glistening from months of snow, mesmerized by all that fast-moving brown water. One of the brothers, I don't remember who, found an old canoe and oars in the garage of the house his mother was renting and they were excited to take it to their place. It was a man-laid drainage channel that wound its way through the fields to a channel that passed under a moderately traveled highway and disappeared into the swampy areas of the sunken forest. Before crossing the fields, a ditch ran along the edge of their small brick and floor lot, and it wasn't difficult for the two of us to drag the canoe a few hundred yards from the garage to the nearest dogs. After putting it in, they followed its curves like an amusement park ride all the way through the fields, down the highway and into the swamp. That would be epic, and so they found themselves, 12 and 14-year-old brothers, carrying the canoe from bow and stern to the end of a cul-de-sac through the backyard of an uninhabited house with a for sale sign out front. And above, wet grass bank of ditch. Where were their parents? That's a good question. Of course, things were different then. Children were often left to fend for themselves and mostly did better. Let them learn by trial and error was the idea. What doesn't kill them makes them stronger. Besides, these parents had other things on their minds. They were lecturers and teachers and hung out with high school students, married young, and moved right into the family farm. High school and reunions kept them moving around quite a bit, and the boys depended almost exclusively on each other in their early years. When Dad was finally offered a position at New Hampshire State University, the small family moved into a small Victorian house with an ancient sugar maple in the backyard and a neat sledding hill across the street. The boys spent their days climbing trees, fighting with hand-cut spare trees, exploring abandoned barns and pastures reclaimed from the burning forest. On summer evenings, they played flashlight tag or organized mock Olympics with their parents, who considered themselves culturally advanced and practiced sharing household chores equally. This led to a constant good-natured competition in the field of cooking, so that in the evening the warm interior of the house was filled with the aromas of various delicious simple dishes, beef stroganoff, fried chicken, tuna casserole, black beans and rabbitut. Dot. Egg tacos the parents had no extra money and sometimes had to save to get by, but they made do with camping trips elaborate Easter egg hunts and winter afternoons at a nearby ski resort. The boys attended the local elementary school, and being small town New Hampshire in the late 1970s, school days could sometimes be difficult. But family life was a protective cocoon, untroubled by serious problems or grief. The boys got used to the feeling of security and unconditional love. They never knew anything else. With all this in mind, Christmas morning probably wasn't the ideal time to tell the still young parents about the separation, which would ultimately be the first step to an awkward divorce. We know you've probably felt tension between us lately, Dad said, though the boys really didn't feel any of it. It's probably only temporary, Mom added, wincing at the shocking devastation she could read so clearly on their faces. We'll just have to try living apart for a while. It was not temporary. The boys saw it instinctively, though their parents did not. They brought the shiny new plastic Christmas sleighs across the street up the hill where the snow was packed and the ice was worn away. There used to be drag races in the neighborhood. Competitors took off running, engaged in dogfights to push or knock the other sled off the track, and the first to reach the row of maples at the bottom of the pasture won. However, the neighborhood kids didn't come out so early on Christmas morning. They were still in their pajamas, basking in the innocent warmth of their childhood living room, opening presents and assembling battery-powered gadgets, and snacking on pancakes and bacon as a family. The brothers hurried up the hard-packed slope, 
discussing things bitterly. Why did their parents wait until Christmas morning to tell them the news? The betrayal only made the feeling of betrayal worse. But the bitterness was just a mask for deeper feelings that were never acknowledged. A sense of panic and abandonment while realizing that their past lives will never return. That the cocoon of happiness and unconditional love was broken. That morning their childhood was over. Not even the arrival of the regulars from the sledging and the wild excitement of the skiing competition could completely distract them, although it enabled them to delay their return to their suddenly intolerable home borders until almost sunset. Changes came quickly. Both parents found new lovers, and actually that may have been part of what caused the divorce. The boys never found out. The Victorian opposite the sledding hill went on the market and sold quickly, which meant the death of the case. The boy's father and a much younger woman who was once his student moved into a small, off-the-grid house on a hillside deep in the woods, with an outbuilding and no indoor plumbing. The boy's mother, whose love affair proved short-lived, moved to a larger city not far away, where she rented an unusual house in the suburbs, with an old canoe gathering dust in the garage. And here we now find the boys living in a new town after the awkward aftermath of the end of their childhood. Not mature enough to be interested in girls, and completely invisible to the older teenagers in town, most of whom seem to belong to a rather seedy overlap group that coalesces around drinking parties, petty drug deals and the occasional fistfight. Sometimes the boys get bored enough to cause minor trouble, such as lighting open fires where they don't belong, or throwing snowballs at passing cars, including one police car that chases them for a while with its lights flashing before speeding away disappears in a cemetery surrounded by old oaks. Sometimes they take great adventures to the edges of civilization, as on this wet early spring day, carrying an old canoe in bow and stern to the edge of a flooded ditch behind the last houses of a cul-de-sac. They drag the boat under the nose over the matted winter grass and emerge into a small eddy that gives entrance to the calm water next to the main current. The younger brother sits in the bow, while the older one pushes the canoe as he jumps in. They know how to do this because they have taken many canoe trips with their parents over the years. The older brother swims the oar to direct them downstream. It's a great feeling, soaring high and fast across open fields. The canal winds down towards the highway with several long S curves. The boys ride the swift brown water in silence, giddy and excited and the canoe keeps its course only occasionally with the eddies of the elder brother's paddle. Some of the children they know run after them across the fields, cheering on these suddenly daring newcomers who use the flood in a plane so high they seem to float above the ground. The plan is to go directly under the freeway through the edge of the city into a wooded swamp. The drum should be the core of the whole adventure, the culmination of their impromptu trip to the amusement park, but a few hundred meters upstream they notice something. Usually, the top of the corrugated metal tube looks like a high-arched, vast tunnel that you don't even have to squeeze your head through. However, the level of water currently flowing under the busy road is so high that the gap is no more than a foot or two above the uneven brown surface, almost certainly too shallow for an upright canoe. Joy disappears. However, they still do not fully understand the danger they are in. The older brother closes the oar, yelling for the younger one to go deeper with him, figuring that all he has to do is turn the canoe around and go back against the current. But the current is too strong, large rope dams undulate invisibly below the surface, and the canoe wobbles precariously to the left. The younger boy drops the oar and grabs the gunners with both hands, trying to steer the boat to starboard, but instead of finding its center, it veers even more sickly to the left, upstream, into the current. At the same time, a stream of cars zoom past unnoticed on the highway, out of sight. The elder brother waddled furiously, but it was too late. The left cannon dives below the surface and muddy water rushes in. If you slow down, the canoe will completely capsize. The older brother is a strong swimmer and reaches the shore above the drum, where he clings to the edge of a rusted grocery cart left at the foot of a tree. The younger brother does not reach the coast and arrives in the dark. The overturned canoe hits the corrugated archway several times before being followed inside. Perhaps their father's second wife, a former student, 
was unconsciously jealous of the place the boys still held in their father's heart. Although it was almost certainly his good intentions, the feeling they most needed in their lives. At that moment there was stability and discipline. It made him feel that he had to be so strict with them. But she could never replace their mother, and whenever they came to spend the night in the cabin, they spent the time not having to work in the barn, reading or listening to music or being bored. To play chess their main home was their mother's traditionally nicer house in the city, but even there they couldn't escape the feeling that something was wrong. He had dark circles under his eyes and was often prone to crying without provocation. Sometimes he tried to trust them, but that only embarrassed them and drove them away. One day, when the older brother was at soccer practice, he and his younger brother came to sit on the couch in the TV room. I know you felt it was somehow your fault. What happened between your father and me? I never felt like this at all, mom. What makes you think that? That's common with divorced couples with kids, especially your age. They tend to take the blame when they shouldn't. You shouldn't. Well mom, I'm not. Everything is fine. Are you sure dear? Yes. Don't worry about me. And it was true. He certainly didn't blame himself for his parents' divorce. Rather, his problem was that he couldn't shake the premonition. It seemed with almost terrifying certainty that another life-shattering disaster was coming. He jumps through the cold water, no idea up or down. The top of his skull hits the corrugated metal roof of the drum and he gasps for air, fighting to keep his mouth above water as he is pulled downstream through a low ceiling tunnel. A part of him realizes that he is probably going to die. The current pulls him down again, twisting him into a numb, directed darkness. The side of his face grinds against the gravel floor and he pushes away with his hands, standing up briefly. He tilts his head back to take another muddy breath before being wrestled back by the braided current. He had heard somewhere that drowning people experience a moment of peace before death, a kind of blessed release, but he doesn't feel that now. No peace, no liberation, but an irresistible current that swirls him over and over in the insignificant darkness. Like an astronaut whose tether broke. Away from everything he loves in life. Mom, dad and brother. A Snickers bar. A nice hot shower or a familiar TV show. Suddenly, a powerful mechanism grabs the front of his t-shirt and pulls him up through the muddy brown water and out into the painfully bright daylight. In his panic, a sound rings in his ears, like the roar of some giant engine that turns over and over and cannot reach. You're hyperventilating is the older brother's voice, full of sweet excitement. Calm down and breathe normally. Everything is fine. He lies on his back on the muddy grass. The machine's voice comes from his own lungs, and when he follows his brother's advice to breathe normally, it stops. He is not drowned. There is a soothing hum in the background on the freeway. The early April sunshine warms his cheeks. And his whole life stretches out before him. His older brother taps him on the chest. Get up. We have to go find that canoe. Hey there, beautiful bookworms. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel. Your likings helps this channel a lot. Have a great good night's sleep.